I was struck by, again, either the naivety, the willful blindness, the hubris of some parts of our cultural community to say, oh, this is freedom of speech. There is a huge difference between paid propaganda from malicious states and informed freedom of speech in a democracy. And if we don't understand the difference, and if we don't get a fulsome understanding of how Russian propaganda works, what its purpose is, how, how it happens here, we have a real problem. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of On the Edge with Philip Itner. Our guest this week is Canadian Senator Stan Kutcher, uh, who first came to my attention during a controversy at the Toronto International Film Festival, a uh, Russian piece of propaganda of information warfare posing as a documentary was scheduled to be shown, um, but due to the efforts of the senator and uh, those like-minded, it was rightfully removed. Um, Senator Kutcher is himself a descendant of Ukrainian immigrants because whether you know it or not, there are long-standing ties that go back well over a century between Canada and Ukraine because every time uh, they've had a chance, Ukrainians have fled Moscow's aggression and its tyranny to only to find a new home in Canada. So there's lots to talk about, from the controversy uh, to the current war uh, to Canada's and the West's support, or lack thereof, for the Ukrainian war effort. Senator Kucher, thank you for joining us. Um, I uh, became aware of you, uh, firstly, and, and I think we should tackle this topic uh, uh, straight out the park, uh, straight out the uh, gate here, uh, before we talk a, a little bit about, you know, Canada-Ukrainian relationships, um, you came to my attention because of the Toronto International Film Festival, in which there was a film that had been put together by a Russia Today correspondent, and I put that in quotation marks because Russia Today does not put out journalism, it puts out propaganda. They had a film in which uh, this uh, RT uh, journalist, again quotes, uh, was embedded, again quotes, uh, with the Russian army on the other side of the line yeah. and, of course, trying to humanize uh, a military that has been conducting war crimes since the full-scale invasion started and, and even before that. What was your experience with that festival and, and getting that film pulled? Well, a couple of things. Maybe I could start at the sort of larger area and then hone in on the smaller one. Um, the the, the modern-day version of propaganda that Russia has been using against Western countries, Western democracies, um, has, uh, has, has a, a substantive history. It's very different than the kind of propaganda we saw during the Cold War. And it moved into uh, what people call soft or sharp propaganda, designed to uh, create divisions in democratic societies, to pit people in democratic societies against each other, and in so doing, work to destabilize uh, uh, democratic societies. It's part of a, a larger destabilizing eff effort that's going along with other autocratic kleptocracies, such as China, uh, North Korea, Iran, and Russia. So many, many Canadians have absolutely no idea about this. Many. Just mm. had no idea whatsoever. It first came to my attention in about uh, 2013, 2014, in my work in mental health. I'm a physician, a psychiatrist, and I was doing work on improving mental health for young people, and I began to notice some very unusual material coming through electronically, through social media primarily, but in other places as well. And it was very focused on the anti-vaccination movement. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, at that time, I, I got interested in that, and then I realized that a lot of this that we were seeing was actually Russian propaganda coming in in very, very different kind of ways. Uh, through journalists who either knew better or didn't care to know better, through academics in the Vladi 
uh, uh, group that uh, that Putin organized. He again, he either should have known better or didn't care to know better, or were frankly just doing their thing, parroting uh, Kremlin talking points. And through a whole host of social media channels, and it has it's turned out, there has been a Canadian company, a large one, Tenet Media, which has taken Kremlin propaganda and just spread it all across Canada. So f for me, when I saw this about this film, it was clear, clear, clear uh, Russian propaganda. No journalist in Russia is independent. No journalist no. is embedded in the Russian military, wears a uniform of a Russian soldier and gets the Russian authorities for to seven up, months. Yeah, and gets yeah. the Russian authorities to upload all her, her, her files, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into all that. I was struck by, again, either the naivety, the willful blindness, the hubris of some parts of our cultural community to say, oh, this is freedom of speech. There it is a huge difference between paid propaganda from malicious states and informed freedom of speech in a democracy. And if we don't understand the difference, and if we don't get a fulsome understanding of how Russian propaganda works, what its purpose is, how, how it happens here, we have a real problem. So for me, this film was a real wake up telling me that I had to get involved in both in the wider public sphere and more, again, in my own work uh, in the Senate. So uh, that, that was what galvanized my activities on, on, on this film. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting you point that out, your history with mental health, because it is almost an insidious attack on our psyche what the Russians do when it comes to propaganda. And you, you mentioned Tenet there as well. The, the sooner we in North America, obviously with this crucial vote coming up in, in the United States, um, if we do not wake up to the fact that our minds are under attack, our, our, our sense of the world around us is being um, uh, attacked because that's what Russia does. Is it, it, it doesn't, it, the aim is not to, um, is not to prove you of a contrary belief. Your the aim is to destabilize your sense right. of reality. Mm -hmm. So there is no there is no truth, and that's very disturbing. It's interesting that you bring this up because I did want to talk to you about this. You know what what attacks you mentioned Tenet there, but what attacks have you seen in Canada? Because the Russians Moscow does target Canada with intent. Oh, of course. Yeah, there, there's also a history to that. So in the 1950s, yes. we had the Guzenko affair, where we had the cipher clerk in the Russian embassy coming with <laughs> all the stuff that had been stolen. And it, I think it took three times for him to visit the RCMP. And then only he got a tip that Russian agents were coming to his home. He hid in another home. And only after that did Canada take notice. I mean, Western democracies... Uh, have been asleep at the switch for a while. And I think after the end of the Cold War, people felt, okay, whew, that's all over, no more. We, we know Russia's going to be nice I from got now that on. sense as well. They yes. have no idea that Russia is an empire and that the purpose of empire is to take over other, other places. And they also don't understand this pure Slav Russian, uh, uh, almost eugenic kind of framework um, that that, that uh, is so prevalent in Russia. They don't understand that Russian values are not the Bolshoi ballet, that Russian values are very, very different from the values that we hold as foundational to our Western democracies, completely different. And they have very limited understanding of the long-standing genocidal interventions by Russia in Ukraine. Um, yes. You know, those of us who have Ukrainian roots my grandparents and parents came here after World War II as refugees. We lost everything on both sides of the family, everything. Family members murdered, all the land taken, everything. There is no love lost, and people understand how Russia works. In Canada, when people think about Russia, lots of people think, oh, the ballet, oh, they play ice hockey, they've got a good hockey team, you know. You can get some, some borscht, which is actually Ukrainian, not Russian, but they get us all mixed up anyway. So, so there is this naivety in the West, and we're so protected from it that Russia has taken advantage of that. Uh, and you, I think you're absolutely right. The purpose is to sow so much confusion 
and to turn people in democracies against each other on the basis of that confusion. Now, that being said, I must tell you that I have some substantive concerns that uh, in some countries, not so much in Canada, but if I look to our neighbors to the south, I think Russian influence has gone way beyond just destabilizing ideas and democracies. Uh, there is no way that Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin aren't like this. And uh, Ann Applebaum, who's a writer for The Atlantic, recently published a yes, book, which uh, Autocracy Incorporated, outstanding. She's hit it right on the head. So we're living in a time when, even in our own country, we find that the political debates <clears throat> used to be very much about policy. You know, I want higher taxes, I want lower taxes, I want to take my <clears throat> tax dollars and put them towards this type of program, I want to take tax dollars, put it to that kind of program. That, that, that policy thing, you know, tweaking where, where the country's going, but still fundamentally sharing the same values. What I've seen in the last eight years, more so in the last four, is a pulling together away from policy debates to values-based arguments. Mm -hmm. And Russia is superb at poking that bear, pardon the metaphor. Um, you know, LGBTQ rights. There are no LGBTQ yeah. rights in Russia. And so Russia pokes that and pokes that and pokes that. So that's just a simple example. The anti-vaccine movement in Canada has been highly infiltrated for years and years by Russian propaganda. Again, people fighting with each other. You're 100% right. Um, and it, it worries me because... Um, you know, the the greatest trick that you know, the old saying, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing the world it wasn't real. You know, you know he wasn't real. There has been an effort, a concerted effort uh, in the United States. And I want to see if maybe it's in Canada as well, that there's a pushback against um, the the fact. If you look at what's happening, there's, the, you know, that Moscow concertedly has a an information warfare campaign that it, we yes. are been under attack, uh, literally under attack uh, in our body politic and our civil society and our media for years and years. But they have made it so, especially with the whole Russia, 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 because the Mueller report came out badly in the States. I wonder if you're seeing it as well, this kind of like, oh, you guys, you all, you see, you know, GR, you see, uh, you know, uh, GRU or KGB or FSB or, you know, SVR, all the Russian intelligence agents behind every tree. And so it's, they, it's easily dismissed. Uh, do, do you have that problem in Canada? Because we sure have it in the States. Um, in Canada, we have a bit of it, uh, and, uh, but not so much. I think uh, there are sort of, if I could look at it, three or four different categories that I would put Canadian society in general in. And then I, I hate to do that because it's such a large generalization. But I would say diverse, the, yeah, absolutely. But I would say the vast majority, the vast majority of Canadian people haven't got a clue what's happening. They haven't got a clue. They wouldn't know a piece of propaganda if hit them between the eyes, because it's done so subtly. It's done through media influencers. It's done through journalist influencers. It's done through academics. And it, it's, it, it sort of gradually seeps in and pervades the culture. If you think of having a, a, a glass of, of, uh, of water uh, just sitting there on your desk and, and you take a, a little droplet of red food dye and drop it in, it sort of spreads really quietly, quietly, and then it diffuses into the whole water and the water turns red. You haven't even realized it's turned red. I think that's the vast majority of Canadians. We do have a group of Canadians who are knowingly uh, taking money to, to do Kremlin talking points. And they're showing up, uh, sometimes with politicians, uh, at these events that are divisive events. The, the trucker freedom convoy, so-called freedom convoy that happened in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. There's uh, groups, with, um, uh, groups that are committed to militarily destabilizing the country. Small groups, but nonetheless. And, and, we're, now, and we're starting to see some of that. It has also been uh, tidied up as academic freedom. So some academics that are very involved in the Valdi Club, for example, are constantly putting out pro-Russian, almost identical Kremlin talking points. And then we have the bot campaigns. It's interesting because sometimes when I put on Twitter, I hate calling it X, but it's because X and Twitter are so completely different, which itself has become a propaganda tool for Russia. Uh, when I put some stuff out there that is critical of Russia or is pushing a particular point that needs to be addressed in Canada politically, I get bot bombed. And it's just like this. 
So it's very sophisticated. It's 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 out there and it's moving. And I I think we're still not at a full and deep understanding of how insidious uh, this uh, kind of intervention is. Uh, the onion is being peeled layer by layer. There is a study now in the House of Commons looking at Russian disinformation and propaganda by uh, Commons Committee. I've proposed a study like that in the Senate as well for a Security and Defense Committee. We have an Election Interference Commission which is looking at direct interference in elections by a number of malignant state actors, not just Russia. But that commission is starting to broaden its perspective because they're realizing that, yes, we may have election interference from malignant state actors in Canada, but the whole interference goes way, way beyond elections, way beyond elections. So there's, and then there is a dedicated, very, very thorough, hardworking group of academics and some journalists who have made this an issue that they are focusing on. So for example, uh, Professor Marcus Kolga at the McDonnell Laurier Institute, who runs an organization called Disinformation Watch, has been outstanding in trying to bring many of these issues uh, to our attention. And there are, there are more of them. So I think that that's how basically we fit in. Um, certainly amongst my colleagues, there is greater and greater understanding and awareness of this. Uh, we're parliamentarians in the Senate. We're not elected. We're appointed. But that gives us a long runway so that uh, we're not dependent on election cycles and that we are able to, once we get topics that people are interested in, we can delve into them very, very deeply. We can get a fulsome understanding of it and we can keep the pressure on. So uh, I'm pleased to see some of that coming. It's late. It's probably a little bit too little as well. You know, the best time to have done something about this was a decade ago. The next best time is right now. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, well, that, that's important because, I mean, it's also, I want to point out uh, to those who don't know, maybe, is that the, there is a massive Ukrainian diaspora living in Canada. 1.5 million, I believe, can, uh, Canadians uh, yeah, around that, are, yeah. have Ukrainian ancestry. Yeah, it's about yeah. three, three and a half percent or four percent of the entire Canadian population. It's the largest single diaspora out, outside of Canada, outside of Ukraine and Russia. So, so it's the largest group of yeah. Ukrainian people outside of Canada and Russia. And it is interesting to note that this is not a new thing. No. Uh, Ukrainians have been fleeing to Canada since the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. Uh, we, we, we see several waves uh, of this happening, um, but they, all the waves, except for this current one, were when uh, Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. And there were these waves whenever the Russian Empire became weak, say at the end of the Tsarist era, yep. uh, during the Second World War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you see these massive waves of Ukrainians running as fast as they can away from Moscow's rule. And they're running to Canada. What does that say about Moscow's way of governance? And what does that say about a liberal democracy like Canada? Well, you know, the bottom line is uh, you don't want to stay where you're not welcome. Or you don't want to stay where someone's going to steal your land and shoot your friends. Uh, that's pretty, pretty basic stuff, right? Um, also, uh, however, there's, Canada has been seen from the very beginning uh, as, a, as a land of opportunity and a safe haven. And uh, if we look back, you're absolutely correct. The, the first big wave of Ukrainian settlers came about 125 years ago to open up the Canadian West. They, they were recruited here by Clifford Sifton, who was then Minister of Interior in, 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 in that government. Um, you know, strong men in sheepskin coats, I think, was the, uh, was the phrase. And they left out the women who actually carried the culture and did all the, lots of hard work themselves, but that was that time. Uh, and really, the Canadian West and, and the Canadian as an agricultural, global agricultural powerhouse could not have built without, been built without Ukrainians. The other interesting thing that some of your viewers may not realize is that Ukrainian culture and indigenous culture merged. And there are some fascinating um, designs, the Kokum design, K-O-K-U-M, is a, is, is a fusion between Ukrainian uh, art art and indigenous art. And it's, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, and and it, it, there's a long history 
uh, between Ukrainians and indigenous peoples and Métis peoples, uh, actually, which is now becoming rediscovered, uh, which is which is fantastic, and it's a very positive history. Um, yeah. So, so we've been around for a while here. Well, I can see some similarities there. I can see some similarities between you know First Nation people uh, feeling maybe that they are being colonized, and Ukrainians who have a long history of colonization by Moscow. Yeah, there is a point. common through line there. <laughs> I think that's a very very good point. Um, and um, the uh, there is a again partly as a result of I would think uh, the Russians' illegal genocidal war on Ukraine. There has been a rediscovery of this tradition, uh, and now I can go to the Bioware Market in Ottawa, and there is a indigenous store that sells indigenous materials, and there are the Kokum scarves, and there are the Kokum ties uh, in those designs. Oh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look into getting me some of those. That's, send that's me, send me, send me your address. I was not aware. Send me your address. I, I I'll, certainly... I'll, send, I'll send you one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator. I mean, it it is important to note the contribution that Ukrainians have made to Canada down through <coughs> the years. And you know, one of the things that moves me it, it comes up in my uh, algorithm uh, upon occasion. Um, is is the scene from I believe it's the is it the Win, Winnipeg, uh, it's the Jets, isn't it? The yeah, Winnipeg, Winnipeg Jets. Jets hockey There's team, this yeah. incident where um, the 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 choir, a Ukrainian choir of I don't think it's Winnipeg, but of, of maybe Canada or, or wherever they had come from, that sang the Ukrainian national anthem, and the entire stadium rose to their feet in respect. And it moves me every time I see that. That is a, that's a beautiful expression of solidarity. True North and the Winnipeg Jets express heartfelt support for Ukraine and for more than 180,000 Ukrainian Canadians living in Manitoba. And now, to perform tonight's anthems, please welcome back Husli Ukrainian Male Chorus. Canadians have reinvigorated or have had that consciousness of the contribution of what Ukrainians have given to Canada. Uh, is is that being reinvigorated, especially with now these refugees that are finding uh, solace there? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question, and it's complex at so many levels. So let me just try to to bash at that a bit. Uh, speaking of the <laughs> as Winnipeg... things as things Ukrainian and Russian tend to be very complicated and immigration and all the rest of it. But yes, yes, yeah. uh, Let's try and simplify well, it. <laughs> let, let's start if we're best we can, uh, realizing that simplicity doesn't always mean clarity. But um, true. You know, let's clarify that, shall we? <laughs> that that we have uh, the Winnipeg Jets actually have a new uh, emblem which incorporates uh, Ukrainian design into the emblem it just just uh, was released a couple of weeks ago and my my, my cousin That's mark true. actually played nhl hockey for both winnipeg and the toronto maple leafs uh, for for many years there is another ukrainian uh, not he wasn't quite as good as wayne gretzky who was ukrainian probably known worldwide <laughs> but he did play in the nhl That's right. for, for yeah. 15 or 20 years um yes i, I think w what has what has happened i mean the ukrainians have always been here and in in some ways they have maintained some of the traditional Ukrainian culture in Canada, culture which was under attack by Russia. The Russification, again, not known by Ukrainians. In fact, not known by a lot of Soviet historians in Canada. The Russification of Ukraine well, came at a great price, changing the language, uh, focusing on Russian uh, education, pushing down the culture, changing the church. You, we all know about that, but the Canadians really didn't know about it. And Ukrainian culture was sort of a sort of an interesting thing. They loved the food. They, they, they were amazed by the dance, the Shumka dancers, the Chernovish company in Edmonton, for example, out there. Just that, but that was sort of like it for Canadians. With the war, there's been a, 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 a whoa. This is something... Really, they make up about 4% of our population. This is really something big. And uh, I actually have a bill that just got through committee in the Senate that's coming back for third reading, which proposes the month of September every year as Ukrainian Heritage Month. And because the first Ukrainians that came in about 125 years ago arrived in September. So um, we, we're going to try to get it out of the Senate fast and into the House and out of the House. And, and it's a... 
it's just like a reawakening of awareness about Ukraine as its own nation that is happening mm. in Canada, which because it was off the radar. But, you know, Canada was the first country that uh, when Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine announced its independence in 1991, Canada was the first country to recognize Ukrainian independence. So it's not as if we haven't been aware of some of this, but it is uh, becoming a more a reawakening. And I myself am an example of that. I grew up in small rural towns in Ontario, primarily, where we were the only family that ever spoke Ukrainian. And we spoke mm. it in the home uh, occasionally. And as we stayed in, in the English, it was English uh, countryside, we lost more and more of the Ukrainian. And my only people that I spoke Ukrainian with were my Baba and Jido. And they lived in Toronto. Mm. And I would see them three or four times a year. So I quickly lost that. With the war, I started to actually become more, even more interested in my own culture and regain that. Started to go back and learn to speak Ukrainian. Uh, the last that I spoke, I was about six years old, and I'm probably at, a, at an eight-year-old level now. So I'm moving up, uh, and, and it's great. Uh, I'm becoming much more aware of my own cultural history, and we're starting to see that develop amongst Ukrainians who have sort of been second and third generation Ukrainians here, and have sort of moved away from the, from the, the, in, in the, the tight Ukrainian community that has existed for, for a long time. So we're starting to see that spread. Um, and as, as people become more aware of, you know, there's the hockey players, there's the artists uh, like Kurlek. Hmm. Roberta Bonder was the first woman to walk in space, as Ukrainian-Canadian. But, you know, on the political side, we've had some pretty impressive people. We had Governor General, Premiers of Provinces, and Senator Paul Yudsik, who preceded me in the Senate oh. by quite a bit. He, was, he is considered to be the father of Canadian multiculturalism. He was the guy who said, look, Canada is more than just English and French. Canada is this mosaic of all these cultures that bring to the country this incredible richness. And one of the things about Canada is we are rich because we are diverse. It causes us problems, but it also is a strength. And the better that we understand the diversity and the unity, the unity that we can have in our diversity, the better kind of a country we will become as long as we continue to maintain our core values. And that's what the Canadian multicultural mosaic is about, different than the American melting pot. Okay, it's the multicultural I find mosaic. That, <clears throat> I find that fascinating because that's a very Ukrainian uh, <laughs> sensibility. Um, because the, 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 they have been forced to be multicultural in many ways because empires have crossed through here so many times that they've had to find ways to accommodate uh, one another. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, as it's been, I've said it many, many times before, you know, uh, Ukraine became multicultural because empires crossed through here. Russia became multicultural through conquest, and it's yes. a very different way yeah. of, 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 of gaining that. So I'm not surprised it would be a Ukrainian that would uh, champion that in, uh, in Canada. How are the current... Um, refugees, the guys who are running this, <laughs> running away from this awful war here. Um, I know they're finding a home in Canada, but how's that going? Are they still being warmly received? Are they integrating? How's that process going? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I, I don't have solid data. I, I know many people in that in that wave. It, it, it's a part of the Ukraine Safe Haven program that Canada created. Um, it's a bit of a challenge. Because uh, is it the question, is this a temporary program or is it permanent? Is there a pathway to permanent uh, residency through here to Canadian citizenship? Yes or no? Unclear. Some making applications, some not. Some people who have come have gone back uh, because they, their families are still there. They wanted to be with their families. Uh, some people have come and stayed and have integrated very, very well into, into Ukra the Canadian society as Ukrainian Canadians or as Cana or, you know, into, they have jobs, they're making a contribution, they're paying taxes, they're doing some fantastic work. Uh, actually, I have a person that works for me in my office uh, on a part-time basis who was part of that uh, safe haven group, uh, helps me with a, a lot of the work I'm doing with the Ukrainian diaspora community. So, uh, and, and, and many other people have, their children are in school, you know, or they have children who have been born here. 
Uh, and so this is going to be a bit of a, of a challenge for us uh, to figure out how to make sure that we are helpful to the people who have come here, some of whom are really wanting to stay and make Canada their home, others who have mixed loyalties. Some want to go back, some don't want to go back. Uh, it, it's not, not something that I can predict. It's something that will work out. Uh, certainly the longer that the Russia's war on Ukraine continues, the more challenging it will be for people to go back and reintegrate. I know there's a huge wish to have people come back who have skills and are skills that are needed in Ukraine for rebuilding, uh, reconstruction. Uh, I'm not, I don't know how that's going to turn out. Um, yeah. By and large, uh, the people from Ukraine who have come here in the Safe Haven program have been very welcomed. You know, not, not all. It's, but by it's, and my, large. it's my, I know it's a concern here that the longer this war goes on and the longer people integrate into the com communities where they have found safe haven, that they may lose the desire to return. And there will be a massive need for yes. uh, people to come back because after this war is, is over, because no war lasts forever, there's going to have, be a massive rebuilding and also um, building a new country. I mean, this is going to be a new liberal democracy um, a, a powerhouse potentially on the European continent by sheer size. Um, I know you say you don't have data, but uh, in your work with the diaspora, is there still, is there a tipping point that's happening? Where do you, where's your, what's your gut telling you when you talk to the diaspora that's come recently, whether or not they're going to stay or whether or not they're going to come home? Well, I've heard both, both perspectives. Uh, and I think a lot of that is very individual. There are whenever we look at uh, going going somewhere else, there are push factors and pull factors. And so uh, the question, the, the 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 push factor from people leaving Ukraine to come to Canada is pretty clear. Though there were some pull factors because some of the people who came from Ukraine to Canada when the war began um, actually had ties in Canada already. They they were working. Mm. They were so so. They, for them, there was this pull factor as well as the push. Some of the of that group have strong pull factors going back. Elderly parents, for example, who will need care. Uh, that's a pull factor. Um, opportunities uh, in 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 the reconstruction and rehabilitation in Ukraine. Those are going to be pull factors as well. Push factors from here to Ukraine, maybe not so much. I, I can't say it's it's a very much of an individual thing. So I can't predict what that what that movement is going to be like. Um, I don't know what the what whether there is a tipping point, uh, Philip. I, I don't know uh, if there is a tipping point that is time based. After so many years, how strong is the yeah. pull got to be? After so many years, how much is the inertia playing a role? I mean, if you've got a house, you've got a good job, you've got a good car, you've got children who have been born here. And are in school, they have friends. Yeah, so what do you do then? Absolutely, you've, you've made a new life. Uh, so do you uproot all that for some degree of uncertainty going back? It, it's, it's complicated. I wish I had a clear answer, yeah. but I just don't. It's another, it's another um, trial. It's another difficulty that this war that's been inflicted upon Ukraine uh, has their citizens doing. It's... It's just a fact of life in a difficulty. It's it's. Could I could I just add one thing to that to that as well? Is I think it depends on how the war ends. If the war yes. en if the war ends with a r off ramp that we trade territory for peace, that's a chimera. That's just complete nonsense. We know that that'll last. I mean, just kicking the can down the road. Yeah, Canada, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal for for protection. Right? Look at what kind of protection it's getting. Uh, it also, this war has shown that the Western countries are, are all, and this is going to sound harsh, but they're almost happy to have Ukraine be the borderland and have Ukraine bleed to save the West. Give them just enough support that they can stave off the fighting, stave off the inevitable. I think people in the West, many policymakers, um, foreign specialists were shocked that Russia didn't take Kiev in the first two weeks. 
They're shocked. They, they yes. decided it was going to be us to walk in and take it over. But they didn't. And, and you know, I have a T-shirt with the tractor on it, right? I mean, that's... Pulling so, the tank? Yeah. The, 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 yeah. the resilience and the incredible drive of Ukrainian people has shocked the world. And you made a point mm -hmm. about uh, uh, Ukrainians are going to be building a new country, a liberal democracy. Absolutely. Absolutely they will. But it's going to be a military powerhouse. Yes. You know, because, uh, I mean, I just had this chat uh, a few uh, weeks ago about Canada was so happy. We sent 800 drones or 8,000 drones. I can't matter. You know, I think you used 10,000 a week or something. We, we, we sent you 8,000. We we're so happy. Well, when I talk to people in Ukraine, we don't want those Canadian drones because ours are so much better. <laughs> we now know how to build them <laughs> at that little, little, yeah. little uh, paw shops, yeah. right? So, so I think all of a sudden... These foreign and they know how to use them better. Exactly. Oh, yeah. my goodness gracious. Yeah. So, no, so we're going to be, I, yeah, no, I'm sorry. <coughs> go ahead and finish your thought. Though. No, no, I, I, I that, the thought was finished. Well, the, the, the words are still coming. Well, it's well. just, it, I, I, not only that, but um, there has been widespread talk uh, throughout Europe because there's concern that America, especially if it goes down the road with Trump for a second time, is no longer a reliable member of NATO. And there may be a need for a Ukrainian defense alliance, uh, I'm sorry, a European uh, yeah. defense alliance in which Ukraine would be perfect. They, they are the best fighting force on the continent, hands down, and they've got the experience in the latest cutting edge techno military technology and warfare techniques. They could train a European defense force. So, you know, this is, um, it's not just a one way street. I think Absolutely. there are things that Ukraine can provide the West when it comes to how to fight a modern war. I think you're absolutely right. The, the, this war has uh, has changed the. And I'm not a historian of war, so I just want to be really clear about that. Fair but when, when when I look at this war, uh, I, I'm reminded of way back in medieval times. It's like when, when the British archers uh, took the field against the old knights. You know, it was swords and spears, and then it was the longbow. And the longbow was a technology that vaulted the British ahead of everybody else, and then other nations took it. And then the next one was, of course, the use of artillery, and Napoleon was the, the master of the use of artillery. So, and, and Ukraine is, is doing this technological innovation on the fly, and, <laughs> and, and this asymmetrical kind of warfare, a small state against a behemoth state, is asymmetrical warfare, and they're 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 doing a great job at it. So, and it's because they're mastering, they're changing the way that war is engaged, and they're mastering the tools that that underlie that engagement. So, I, as I look at the way how how war has changed across the centuries, I see this as an innovative change. When when you can knock out the <laughs> a Russian fleet out of the back sea, and you don't have a navy. Now, that is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And making Sevastopol the cause of so much of this war no longer viable. So <coughs> I think you're I, I think you bring up these very good points. But at the, at, as much as the Ukrainians say our drones are better. Uh, thank you, Canada. But we're, we're doing fine. They still need some stuff that they can't Absolutely. provide here that they can't Absolutely. develop. Here. They need. They need armor. They need, uh, you know, they need shells. More than anything else, they need shells. Um, Canada has been, uh, you know, a very strong supporter in, in terms of kit, actual, you know, tangible things that you send over there. Are you satisfied with what Canada has done? Do you want them more? Where is your criticism and where uh, do you think we've been getting it right when it comes to these tangible things for help? Okay, I think that that's a, that, that's a that's a uh, complex question. I'll try to pull it <laughs> apart a little in little bits. Again, <laughs> well, of course, sir, we live in a complex world. Um, so we if you indeed. look, at, if you look at humanitarian aid to Ukraine, Canada has stepped up quite a bit. They're billions of dollars. It's not at where I would like to see it. We, when we look at GDP uh, 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 support for Ukraine, a percentage support for Ukraine as a per, per percentage of GDP, we, we're sort of in the last third of the pack. So I'd like to see us really increase that. Um, you know, we've had some just uh, 
there are no excuses for that. It, 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 it's fr you can see the frustration in my voice. We promised the mm. Patriot missile system to Ukraine years and years ago. still hasn't been delivered. Uh, Ukraine needs munitions badly, badly, badly. Our capacity for ramping up our internal munitions of production so that we could both share munitions with Ukraine but also replenish our own stockpiles has been bogged down in bureaucratic red tape for years. Can't understand how we can't get our act together. It shouldn't be that hard to make shells, for crying out loud. Uh, we have the capacity, just hasn't been... The procurement has not been what it should be. So we've had our problems there, and 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 uh, and, and, and I think we have to do a lot better. And we, I just think we just need a little bit stronger leadership to cut through some of this bureaucratic red tape. On the other side, uh, I think we've been doing some pretty good things. Uh, people probably don't know, but I give credit where credit is due. Krista Freeland, who's our Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, is Ukrainian. She has uh, pushed and pushed and pushed within cabinet uh, for more uh, aid for Ukraine. She has been very involved in the work that's been done on seizing, uh, freezing and seizing Russian assets and using that money to, to, to bring back to, to, for Ukraine. Uh, Canada was uh, very much involved in creating the International Monetary Fund uh, account for uh, assistance to Ukraine, which has brought in you know billions and billions and billions of dollars through the IMF. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that's happened behind the scenes. Uh, and Canada had a military presence in training Ukrainian troops through Operation Unifier prior to this uh, last uh, phase of the war when, when Russia invaded Donbass and Crimea. Ukraine uh, uh, actually called on Canada back in uh, 2014. That's right, and so so we did have a, a small uh, role to play in terms of helping train you know, the Ukrainian troops, and then they they they, they took it from there. So, uh, and we've had a long history of working in democratic reform, particularly in the judicial system. Canada has had uh, a long-standing relationship with Ukraine in training judges and lawyers to work in a judicial system uh, reform capacity as well. So. I think we've done some good things. I think we really, really need to do more. My worry is uh, we are suffering from war fatigue. Uh, and the second thing is that the Russian propaganda and disinformation that we have had uh, when we first started this, we were chatting about, has become more and more ramped up and really pushing Canadians to say, well, we want to give less support to Ukraine and use that money for something else. So, uh, so we're we're in this um, interesting flexion point in time to see which way this goes. Do you still? So, look, uh, as we kind of wind down our conversation here, I mean, in, you bring up an interesting point with the uh, the warfare again, the psychological warfare, the information warfare. One of the things that they have done repeatedly is push the Nazi narrative. Yeah. And a lot of uh, a, a lot of Ukrainians who fled uh, after the Second World War had been part of the partisan units, uh, which had some questionable alliances. Uh, uh, the Poles, or you know, the po Poles and Ukrainians are on a road to reconciliation about this, but there is decidedly some animosity there um, because there were. I mean, this was a this this is where the bloodiest conflicts, uh, 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 the front lines in the Second World War were. Um, there was a lot going on here, and a lot of people who left maybe had done some horrible things. Um, but they love to attack it. That's Whether or not it's true, they love Bandera. They love the UPA, the Ukrainian Partisan Army, which is accused of war crimes and had been in the past mostly by Moscow. But they, they love using it. They don't really care about it. They use it as information warfare. You talk about the money aspect. Is that Nazi narrative still? Uh, I mean, there was the incident in Parliament, which was, you know, unfortunate, of course, where a, a former UPA fighter uh, was then subsequently accused of being, you know, working with the Nazis. Um, but again, very complicated. Do you also get the Nazi narrative still in Canada? Yeah, we do. And, and that's being pushed by the Russian disinformation and then by the bots. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, that, and that is really push, push, push. You know, part of this is ignorance. It is complete and utter ignorance. And, and uh, I feel badly about saying that, but I have to say it. A lot of Canadians are ignorant about what happened in World War II. We, we have no idea. We have no idea. That was fought somewhere else. 
when I look at some of the pictures that that survived my family's transit through the through the work camps and, and the sicknesses and the horrors of the war and everything else, and I see that, uh, and and of course these are stories that have been passed down to me. Uh, Canadians haven't a clue. Nobody bombed Canada during World War Two. Mm. You know, we were we were over there. Not the war was not fought. We have no idea, and people ha- are so quick to judge, even though they have no idea. I mean, the Galassia Battalion, which is with this incident around, is a complex story. Lots of people who yeah, fought fair. on the side of the Germans joined up with the Germans because they hated the Russians so much. But also, well, they just gone through the Holodomor. No they kidding. Just, just no. gone through the Holodomor. Absolutely. Everybody knew somebody who had been starved to death by Stalin. Absolutely. So you're, you get either either you got the the invading Nazis, uh, who are reprehensible little human beings, or you've got I mean. And everybody Stuck that in the served middle. in the German army wasn't the Nazi. <laughs> also true. You know? Uh, you know what I overheard one time in a market here, Senator, was uh, I overheard an old couple talking about the war, the Second World War. And they said, well, you know, the Germans brought chocolate at least. You know, whereas the only thing Moscow brought was repression and death and starvation and cruelty and well, oppression, you know, the, you know, denying you your language, denying you your identity. Well, absolutely. You know, I that's mean, both the, equally horrible. When the Germans moved in, they were ha- hailed as liberators at the beginning. And then people, oh, yeah. these guys aren't liberating. They're just, another, they're just uh, you know, a, yeah. different, a, a different wolf in a different kind of sheep's clothing. Uh, but the complexities are incredible. Like when, when, when my, my Jido was, was, was alive and he would tell me stories when I was young about what, how his family survived. It's just unbelievable. Do you he have dug... one? Do you have one that you can tell me? Sure. Uh, they they dug a hole in the woods near the farmhouse, and they slept every night in this hole because they weren't sure if the German soldiers were coming through, the partisans were coming through, when the when the Russians came through. It was just unbelievable, and then they were faced with the choice. Either they were rounded up by the Germans, you could be shot, or you could get on a train and get taken to Germany and put into a work camp. That was your choice. <laughs> now, you tell me how you would choose. No <laughs> Canadian yeah. has a clue about it. They, when they would sleep, they would, take, they would wrap bread in, 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 in burlap bags in case the, someone came and pulled them out at night, they would have bread with them. Canadians haven't got a clue what this was like. Well, and of, so of course they would flee from that kind of persecution, from Moscow's yeah. persecution. I don't know why people uh, still make this about NATO expansion or well, that's some a, that, other. That, that's the, that's it, the Putin it, line, excuse. right? Yeah, it's all the Russian propaganda, but the people who still absorb that kind of propaganda, not understanding the history of, of, you know, but don't you see, I mean, this was happening, the first wave of Ukrainians that came to you, you know, to Canada were in the 1890s, as we That's already right. discussed. Yeah. They yeah. weren't fleeing, they weren't fleeing Putin. No. They weren't fleeing the Soviet Union. No. They were fleeing the constant through line of what Russia and Moscow does to Ukrainians. And uh, I can tell you, uh, Senator, from on the ground here in Kiev, uh, it ain't going to happen again. This is it. This is the last Ukrainian war of independence. And we're going to see the emergence of an amazing country on the continent that will hopefully, uh, with the assistance that Canada is providing, the West is providing, not only in military terms, but I think doing the, the judicial system is fantastic. As you know, Zelensky himself has said, Canada is it's almost like a relative, is, <laughs> is the way he refers to Canada. So I, I hope for um, very strong, good ties uh, to remain between uh, Canada and Ukraine. I suspect they will. Is there anything else you'd like to say to my audience as we kind of close out here about what they need to be looking at when it comes to Western support for Ukraine? You know, I just want to tell tell the, your audience that you have, you are living in the worst of times and the best of times. It's that Charles Dickens novel, Tale of Two Cities. It was the worst of times. It was the best of times. It's how it starts. 
the worst of times is this horrific war and, and the death and destruction, the uncertainty and the toll that that takes on everybody. And I hear that from my family members. The, the best of times is that you would have to really go through history in a critical way to find a better leader of a country who, yeah, everybody has baggage. Nobody's perfect. But this is a person, uh, Yatut, I'm here. <laughs> give me ammunition, don't give me a ride. And, then, and has been able to galvanize a sleepy, lethargic West. And I mean sleepy and lethargic West. Not only do that, but also in the face of really incredible opposition that has been, had taken decades to enmesh itself in the West, and that's from the Russian influence. A lot of this, in my opinion, and I'm worried, but also hopeful, will become clear in November in the United States. If, and I'm going to be, I shouldn't be saying this as a Canadian senator, but I have never seen an election campaign and I, 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 I'm a dropout, a PhD dropout in history before I went to medicine. But so I can say a little bit about it, but with, with, with hubris aside, I have never seen a, a more stark uh, choice in presidential candidates than I've, uh, in the history of the United States than we see now. We have a misogynistic, racist, convicted felon who doesn't know a lie from a truth. Uh, who has taken a party which was at one time a conservative, solid party, uh, the GOP, and turned it into a MAGA cult. And uh, all sorts of people just swallow everything he says as the, as, as, as the truth, cloaked himself in religious Christianity as the divine Messiah, selling Bibles for $60 a pop that he bought from China at $3 a pop, uh, $1,000 if you have his signature on it. It, it, it. You can't go lower than that. And someone who is in thrall with Putin wants to join the autocratic kleptocracy and take America out of a democracy. I, sus that's I suspect, that's Senator, as, as a Canadian politician, you're being far too cautious. I'll say it if you won't. <laughs> Trump is a puppet of the, the, of the Kremlin. He is – I mean we just – you know, we see time and time again his, his connections to, to, to Russia. He will sell Ukraine – down the river, if if uh, there God there forbid, there, he gets there is there is as you know uh, the story of the Manchurian candidate, and I will just leave it at that. Yeah, uh, but no matter what happens in uh, you know the world's largest or you know strongest uh, liberal democracy uh, in the American project, uh, I doubt that the rest of the West is is going to give up on any on Ukraine anytime soon. And I that's what and that's why the, I think. The, you are, that's why I think the leadership, the leadership in Ukraine has been fantastic because uh, it's bringing everybody into the fold. This whole process now is here's our peace plan. Let's get every one of you involved in, 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 in working on it and making it better. Brilliant, uh, but necessary. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the schisms and challenges of the, of the far right and the alt right and in Europe and all that stuff. That's for another time. But, uh, but I have never seen leadership that's been able to touch so many places so effectively. Uh, I don't know how the guy does it. Um, it's, uh, it's, so Ukraine is cursed with the war, but blessed with the leadership. Yes, and I and I have no doubt whatsoever that no matter what happens in November with the American election, that the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada and simply the Can Canadian people themselves, by and large, uh, will continue their support for Kiev. It, I, I don't. From from over here on this side of the Atlantic, that's how we feel about Canada. Well, that's that how I feel about it. The resolve it too. is strong. I that's how I feel about it too. That's what the polls tell us here. Um, I, I think we're, I, but I also think we need to up our game. I think we need to do that. Uh, I think we need to do more. I, I would like to see us up in the top four or five countries of percent of GDP that we uh, that we spend for for supporting Ukraine. Because you know, really, the, the bottom line here is the war is about Russia's genocidal war in Ukraine. But Russia has genocidal wars all over the world, uh, Syria, North Africa, for example. Um, this one is just the worst of of because it's on European soil. 
So it brings it all home. And you can't, you can't, you can, you can turn a blind eye to Chad, but you can't turn a blind eye to Ukraine. And so what is this, this war is doing, it's actually forcing the West to try to come closer together in a way that had never had to before because they didn't face a common imperialistic genocidal threat in Europe. Which is existential, existential, because they won't stop. This is the, yes. we're at an inflection point, in my opinion. Uh, we either go, you know, to towards the light, towards hope, towards you know liberal democracy, and as I say, the American project, which is shared in the West, or we go to the alternative that Putin provides, which is might makes right. Free, freedom, freedom is costly. Freedom is costly. And we have to stand up and pay the price. Well, I see it coming from Canada, so it's much appreciated. Keep up the good fight. I know you will, Senator. Thank you for your time. Uh, very early in the morning because of our time difference, but we certainly appreciate you coming and talking to our audience. Um, uh, Canada is has been and I believe will continue to be a great ally to Ukraine. So thanks very much, and thank you for your time. And thank you for the opportunity to join you, and you stay safe, and I hope that you and yours, your family, and those people that you care about uh, get through this uh, well. It's a fight worth fighting. Thank you very much. Well said.